Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Hospital for Children. Before we get started, just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you can visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, feel free to enter them in the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them throughout the session. Only Blum Center staff, co-hosts and guest speakers will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have any personal medical questions, please ask your doctor. Right. So next, oh, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Amy. Um, so good afternoon, I hope you're all doing well and thank you for coming to this virtual session of the MGHFC Parenting Series where experts share their knowledge with patients, family and staff on various pediatric health topics. This year, we're co-hosting the series with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. My name is Brianna Beckfold, and I'm a project manager and editor here at Mass General Hospital for Children, which is the pediatric branch of Mass General. And today for our speakers, we have Dr. Shannon Scott Fernalia of Pediatric Primary Care and Dr. Ben Nelson from Pediatric Pulmonary Medicine. So before I begin, I'd like to briefly introduce them both. Um, Dr. Shannon Scott Fernalia is the Director of the Pediatric Residency Program and Associate Chief for Clinical Faculty Development here at Mass General Hospital for Children. She also provides primary care in pediatric group practice. She earned her medical degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook School of Medicine and completed her residency here at Mass General. And secondly, we have Dr. Ben Nelson, who is the Program Director of the Pediatric Pulmonary Fellowship Program, Director of the Pediatric Bronchoscopy Program and Associate Director of Continuing Medical Education here at MGHFC. He's also a specialist in pediatric pulmonary medicine. He received his medical degree from Georgetown University and completed his residency and fellowship in pediatric pulmonary medicine here at Mass General. And from here, I will hand it off to our speakers. Great, thanks uh, Brianna and Amy for the invitation. I'm gonna go ahead and share the slides here. Uh, give me one sec. Okay, I assume you can see that. All right, perfect. Uh, so uh, Dr. Scott Fernalia and I are gonna talk about uh, virtual visits. Uh, we uh, have unique experience in that virtual visits have been uh, a thing in medicine for years now, uh, but they've really become much more prevalent uh, over the last year with the pandemic. I had never done a virtual visit either as a patient or as a provider uh, prior to the COVID pandemic. And so getting up and running, uh, we've, we've run into some hurdles and some challenges, uh, and we were going to go through some of uh, what we thought were some best practices uh, today so that you can get the most out of telehealth, uh, both for you and your, uh, your family. So we do want this to be interactive. So although we can't hear you or see you, uh, we do encourage you to write in comments and questions in the chat as we're going, uh, because we really, although we came up with topics that we thought would be of interest, we really wanna answer your questions and speak to what your concerns and thoughts are. Uh, so feel free to write in the chat successful virtual visits you've had, uh, unsuccessful visits, uh, challenges you encounter, uh, what would be most helpful for you to hear about, and we'll try to actually answer those in real time. Uh, and uh, don't be shy uh, about putting things in the chat. Okay, so uh, we think about virtual visits kind of in three aspects. Uh, one is scheduling the virtual visit. Then you have to prepare for the visit. 
And then what are you going to actually be doing during the visit? So it actually takes more preparation and more, a little bit more thought on your part. Uh, you don't have to necessarily drive to the visit, park and find the office. Uh, but you still need to find the virtual location. Uh, you need to know where you're going to be during the visit. Uh, and you, the more you prepare for the visit, the more seamless it'll be and the more you'll get out of it. And we'll talk about each of these aspects in a little bit more detail as we go. Uh, uh, I was oh, just gonna orient you to sort of what, um, what it might look like when you do those first steps before we kind of dive in. And I just wanted to, um, let everybody know that the preferred way for virtual visits in the Mass General Brigham system is through Patient Gateway. Um, and it's become actually much easier to enroll your children in Patient Gateway and to have um, proxy access as their parents. If you um, have a virtual visit, you would have a screen that looks like on the left where you would see your upcoming visits. Um, this is a screenshot from my own patient gateway and I didn't happen to have any upcoming visits, but it would say that it was virtual. And on the day of the visit, you would actually launch the virtual visit from that screen. The alternative is to use um, a platform called Doximity. And this is also super easy to use, actually even easier. And so we um, encourage you if, there's, if you're having any issues or you can't get into Patient Gateway, not to give up on the idea of a virtual visit. And effectively what happens then is when the um, clinician's ready to see you, you'll get a text on your phone, like the one on the right. Um, and you would just click on the link and open up a screen that would look very similar. Both of these, um, the Patient Gateway platform is through Zoom and it will look just like the Zooms you're used to. Um, Doximity is also very similar um, and is done um, through your phone and you can um, uh, use it that way kind of on the fly. We were hoping to kind of get you guys uh, going with the interactive part by asking a couple of questions of our audience. So I think Amy's going to put these questions up in a poll format for you. Asking just like if people have had the opportunity to participate in a virtual visit for yourself, for your child. Um, if you have, did it go well? Um, and if you have figured out a preference for in-person or virtual visits, I think um, as clinicians, we see real value in both of those. Um, so we'd love to see people's um, answers. Just wanted to check in with you all. Can you see it okay, the poll? Okay, thank you. And Amy, you'll be able to show us the results afterward, right? Yes. Just let me know when you're ready to close the poll and I'd be happy to. I think if we have a handful of answers, we're probably good. It's up to, I can't see how many answers are there. I'll give it another Great. 20 seconds. I wish the polls had some nice music to go along with it. <laughs> okay, so I'll give it another five seconds before I close the poll. And would you like me to share the results with everyone or? They're anonymous. I think that makes sense. We'll just get a little mini view. All right, I'm closing the poll. So great. I think this is kind of exactly where Ben and I were maybe hoping things um, uh, would land in terms of your own personal experience. And I think I'm really excited to see that um, everybody here, or no, that none of you have um, participated um, with your child, because I think that like speaks to the fact that like maybe we can be helpful as you um, start to think about it. And it looks like people's experience when they did have a virtual visit was positive, um, and that like some of you may prefer um, virtual visits most in person and maybe we can help kind of um, identify some times where a virtual visit will you know really be you know could be beneficial for you um, as a parent and for your child so thanks so much for giving us some uh, uh 
background and I'm just going to remind everybody, please put questions in the chat because um, Dr. Nelson and I will be alternating monitoring the chat as the other one speaks. Great. So what I thought might be fun, especially since you uh, don't have a lot of experience with virtual visits, is to do the game uh, Two Truths <laughs> and a Lie. Uh, so what this is, is two of these things uh, are things that we have experienced during uh, virtual visits. And there is one thing on here that we have not experienced, and that's the lie. So go ahead and put in the chat a, B, or C, which one you think did not happen uh, to one of us during our virtual mm -hmm. visits? And we'll give you a minute to put in the chat because I'm curious to what you guys will guess. I see a couple answers coming through. So, yeah, most people are guessing C. Uh, we have someone for A as well. Um, so the answer here for this one is C. Uh, so believe it or not, I uh, am a pediatrician, yet the child who the patient was for uh, was not at home during the virtual visit. Uh, Several this is times. <laughs> yeah, this happens all the time. Can you imagine going to the physical doctor's office and not bringing your child with you? It would never occur to you, yet it happens all the time on virtual visits. I've had issues where the parents weren't at home. And same type of thing. Could you imagine sending your child, if they're under 18, to the doctor's office by themselves with no parent accompanying them? Uh, believe it or not, it happens in the virtual world. And one thing to stress here is uh, the uh, chance of being Zoom bombed is basically nil uh, because the, there's a higher level of encryption associated with our virtual platforms. Uh, they're all HIPAA compliant. Uh, and so it's really not possible uh, for a random person to enter the visit. You can um, send, uh, invite other people to join the visit, such as um, a, another parent who isn't in the same location, an interpreter, uh, some, some medical professional. So other people can join, um, but you'll never really uh, have an experience where you get randomly Zoom bombed uh, by someone, which is, which is good. <laughs> the added um, uh, invitation to someone else is also a way to work around if you have an older child who might be home on their own and you're now back in person at work. And um, that's a way to have a joint shared visit where you may not be in the same space, um, which may be um, an advantage of some kinds of virtual visits. And so um, it, it expands the ability that way. That's a great point. Oh, and we just got a question, Ben, actually about oh. this, um, which is perfect timing around um, older teenagers. So um, I would recommend, and I recommend this if you're doing an in-person visit as well, that if your child is under 18 and you are not for some reason gonna be there that you check to see if that's allowed by the practice that you're seeing. We are technically not supposed to be treating children um, without consent from parents. Um, some, uh, in some situations and for, with some uh, clinicians, that's gonna be fine if you're there by phone, if, you're in the per if I'm in the office with you, or kind of check, you know, maybe a quick check-in in the beginning with a shared virtual visit and then um, you hop off. Um, but I would encourage you if, you're, if, if your child is under 18, you should be explicit with whoever is booking your appointment about whether that is or isn't allowed because it certainly has left um, both um, clinicians and I think families frustrated if a visit had to be sort of changed or rescheduled because a parent wasn't available. Perfect. Uh, okay, so scheduling the virtual visit is kind of the first uh, step in this process. And it sounds pretty easy, but there's actually a lot of thought that should go into this. So should the visit be virtual? Should the visit be in person? How do you decide? Is this an initial visit? Have you ever met the physician before? Is it a follow-up visit? Is it an acute visit where the child is sick? What's the reason for the visit? And we'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide. Uh, but the, if you're not sure, uh, that's what the staff is for. 
they can help uh, guide you as to what is most appropriate. So then you should think, well, what time of day do I want to have the visit? This might depend on your work schedule. Uh, it might uh, depend on your child's school or activity schedule. Uh, what else usually is going on in your home at or wherever you're going to be doing the visit at that time of day? Uh, you have to think about where you're going to be and how you're going to do this. And then what day of the week? You might usually see your physician on Mondays uh, and they might go to satellite offices the rest of the week. Well, with virtual visits, it, you don't have to necessarily see them in the location you normally do. So for instance, I see patients in Boston, but I also see patients in Danvers and Concord. And so if I normally see someone in my Boston location, well, I can still see them virtually on a different day, even if I'm at a different location. So it actually gives you a little bit more flexibility as to when you're going to uh, be seeing the physician. A lot of times we're asked about what types of visits make sense to be virtual versus in person. And again, at the time you're scheduling your visit, I would encourage you to work with the staff in the office to make sure that the reason your child's being seen makes sense for the type of visit you're booking. Some things that really lend themselves well to virtual visits are things such as mental health um, uh, disorders, depression, Sorry. and anxiety. Um, uh, things like constipation, where maybe this is a more chronic, um, chronic issue. A number of different kinds of chronic diseases work really well as um, follow-ups in the virtual space. And if you have a child with special health care needs, I think this has really opened up opportunities to um, have follow-up that way. I'm going to pause for a second and see if Dr. Nelson wants to, We're not sharing our slides at the moment. We're oh, not sorry. in um, presentation let, mode. Let me do it again. Sorry about that. No worries. You think I would know how to do this by now? There we go. Perfect. Um, and some rashes. Um, typically, we think of skin exams as not being great as done with a virtual visit, but through Patient Gateway, you can actually send ahead pictures. And I will say our dermatology department at Mass General during the height of the pandemic did almost all of their visits actually with pictures and by phone. Um, so there are there is a chance to sort of send pictures ahead, which can be higher quality. You can review them then with the physician in the virtual visit along with the history. Things that really don't make sense to do in a virtual space are things where the, a physical exam is very um, critical. So I can't look in someone's ears and see if they have an ear infection. Dr. Nelson can't assess um, if you're currently wheezing or currently have crackles that sound like a pneumonia. If I need to give you vaccines, I can't do that in the virtual visit. Things like acute abdominal pain are really important to get that physical exam um, uh, done at the same time. And for kind of our competitive athletes in the older age range um, to do competitive sports clearance uh, needs to be in the office. Basically, if blood pressure is really important, if um, a key part of the physical exam is gonna be really important um, or um, you don't have a scale and the weight is very important. I will say we've done um, some infant exams that have um, involved weights um, and certainly older kids who can weigh themselves um, at home. But again, I, we really wanna encourage you to work with the office, but to think about like what things um, might actually be easier virtually. Um, I actually was doing some virtual visits before the pandemic um, solely around mental health issues. Um, and kids who um, are struggling with depression and anxiety, which is even more uh, prevalent now after all of the social isolation, to have them have to trek into the office and home for fairly frequent visits um, always seemed to add to their stress rather than um, kind of uh, addressing the underlying issues. So it's a perfect thing where my listening to your child's heart or lungs is not going to change how I might counsel them around managing um, their anxiety or depression. So um, for those of you who are like are sure in person uh, makes more sense, I invite you to think about like maybe there are some times where not having to park and get up to the office and corral your young one um, or kind of have the role of the eyes of your older one who has to miss the sports practice might make sense. So there's a question that came in um, in regards to taking pictures. Uh, so any tips on how to take a clear picture? Um, 
it, it, there's also a few of other ones you'll add, but um, it's actually fairly hard to do this. I would encourage you to do a couple of different angles. When I'm sending pictures to the dermatologist, I um, usually uh, try to send more than fewer because I think that then I'm more likely to get one that they like. It's really helpful to identify the body part. Um, to you, it looks obvious that it's right near your child's knee. And for us, it can be really hard if we don't have the orientation. If you say this is their knee, suddenly all the folds kind of pull, you know, go into place in my mind. Um, so good lighting, natural light is particularly helpful and occasionally having um, a ruler in the, um, in the picture. If you're working with a nurse in an office to schedule a visit, they can even preview the pictures and take a look at them. But um, it's a nice way to sort of be able to have a discussion with the doctor, especially if there's you know, a role for topical antibiotics or something like that. And um, you know, if, if more significant in, uh, sense of infection, we'll probably bring you into the office. Yeah, and remember, pictures aren't in isolation, although it's not like uh, uh, you know, uh, an Instagram, Facebook post where you can put a caption. You can always send a message along with the picture, uh, so you can give a little bit of context uh, in addition to the picture. Uh, and it's absolutely helpful. Yeah, and then that virtual visit itself will be more delving into the history. Um, so we're back to two truths and a lie. Um, and we're uh, really interested in thinking with you about which you imagine is the, the lie of these three. Um, one of us being asked to be put on hold because um, the family had an incoming phone call at the same time. Um, the parent was checking out of the grocery store during the visit. Um, or there was a parent in the background in their underwear, um, not realizing they were on camera. So two of these have happened to us and one has not. We'd love a couple of guesses. This is not like a judging kind of question. <laughs> yeah, some comments are coming in. So far the leading vote getter is B. Interesting. Um, so, um, We've got some more votes for B. So um, in this one, it's actually um, A, that neither of us have been asked to be put on hold, although I could envision it potentially happening. Um, but we have had parents both checking out of a grocery store or being sort of um, outside the house running um, errands, um, as well as Dr. Nelson had the benefit of uh, seeing a dad walk by in his underwear, not realizing he was on camera. Um, I think this is all of our Zoom nightmare, so we probably all can uh, uh, kind of <laughs> empathize with that. Um, we'd really like to encourage you to think of these visits the same way you would think about them um, if you were coming in person. And while on occasion we, I've had parents have to step out for something very urgent that's come in by phone, in general, when you're with us in the office, that's not going to happen, right? You're sort of, you know, there and really focused, and that's how you want us to be as well. So we're really encouraging folks to kind of think about when that time is that you're going to have this visit um, and try to um, minimize other distractions and such. All the things that you've been doing as your kids were, you know, in hybrid or remote school for the last year to try and encourage them to also be uh, very present um, during the visit. I also think it um, really models well for our kids. Um, and and I would also just point out when I had the parent checking out at the grocery store, I can't really discuss medical information with them because there's a third party there. <laughs> and so we do have to still think about HIPAA uh, compliance, uh, even in those types of settings. Absolutely. And just last night, I, or last afternoon, I was on the, uh, a visit with a, um, a young 18-year-old patient. Um, and I confirmed with her, she was sitting outside, that she had headphones in. And so that anything I said to her, if somebody happened to walk by, um, would be confidential and that if she opted to say something out loud that was sort of her choice of who might be sitting outdoors with her. Um, so I think that segue is beautiful into thinking about where will you be, where will your child be, and who else will be at home? Who do you want to warn um, as I did to my family that's uh, some of whom are home today like I'm in the dining room for the next hour please don't come in or um, you know so that there's the kind of you know who's going to be in the background. I wanted to uh, use this as a moment to think about when your teenagers, in particular, if they're talking um, with their primary care doctor, but really this happens uh, maybe relevant in a lot of specialties as well. And 
while we really would like to have a parent there for part of the visit, there are times where it's really important to be able to speak privately with um, a teenager. And so talking ahead of time with your teenager about what it's gonna look like if you step out of the room. Are you gonna to go to another floor? Are you actually gonna be sitting kind of on the other side of the glass doors behind me? Um, so that the, the patient and doctor can know. And sometimes it's just meant that I haven't talked about as, um, issues I might otherwise talk about in the office um, and deferred them. And once in a while, you know, on the patient gateway platform, which looks just like Zoom, you actually have the chat function. And so there's the chance to also um, kind of check in um, there. Sometimes having your child not there at the very beginning also makes sense. And I've certainly talked with families um, about really sensitive um, concerns they may have around mental health or things they wanna share with me before I talk with their child. So there's no one exactly right way, but you want to think about how that will play out with you and your child being seen. Um, and um, if you have questions, please ask the office before you come to your virtual visit. Okay, so uh, you wanna do a few other things as you're preparing for your visit here. So test out the technology. The technology is very good. And for the most part, it's very straightforward, but there are issues that come up all the time. Your Zoom might need to be updated. Uh, your computer, when you turn it on, forces an automatic restart. Uh, your audio, are you using earbuds? Are you, or are you not using earbuds? And how uh, is the audio coming in and out of your computer? Because sometimes that can be affected uh, if you have earbuds in or not. Uh, so you wanna be comfortable with the technology, know how to troubleshoot, uh, know how to uh, connect, know how to use the mute button, know how to make sure your camera is on. Uh, some of us use Zoom more than we'd like, uh, others don't use Zoom at all and only use it for these rare appointments. And it can be intimidating if you've never used it before. Uh, so testing out these processes beforehand can really make you more comfortable. And I'll just You're add one thing, if it's okay, because it's an error I made. Um, check the day before, or at least a few hours before, that you can see the visit listed in Patient Gateway. I um, you know, scheduled a patient for an off time that I'm not normally seeing patients, made an agreement with them and then um, forgot to tell my office to put it into patient gateway. So they had no link to click on, um, which we'll get to some of these other questions, but it's helpful to know ahead of time that the link that you can see the visit. Um, mm -hmm. Great point. So know the office phone number. Sometimes things, things happen such as uh, your house gets hit by lightning and your router goes out and you have no Wi-Fi. I make that joke because that actually happened to me uh, last week. Uh, so if your Wi-Fi goes out, uh, you want to know the office phone number so that you can call them and let them know to either reschedule or change to a telephone visit if that's an option that your physician's office uh, provides. Uh, and so you want to have that number handy. And just like you would when you go for an in-person visit, I would say even more so, you really want to write out your questions. And the reason for that is because it can be so easy to forget what you want to get out of this visit. And if you have it there right in front of you, it's okay. You don't need to maintain eye contact the whole time. You can consult your notes uh, and it's really encouraged. And I think you'll get a lot more out of the visit uh, in order to uh, write these questions. And I see, a, um, I see a question coming in. Do we need a patient gateway account in order to conduct a virtual visit? So um, yes and no. Uh, so the preferred way is to have a patient gateway account. And then you can go in just like Dr. Scott Fernaglia showed us, click the link and an encrypted Zoom pops up. If you do not have patient gateway, that's when we use other platforms such as Doximity. Uh, that is, uh, e that's uh, usually done via text messaging through phones and or uh, you can also do it on a desktop or a laptop as well. Uh, so although technically you don't need patient gateway, I find that both as a provider and a patient myself, it's much easier to have patient gateway because then you can check to make sure the appointment is listed. You can ask for, to reschedule. Uh, you can send your physician messages. 
so I do think it's actually a lot easier to have a patient gateway account. Okay, so next, uh, something that sometimes, you know, I, parents are very good about bringing snacks for their children or toys or something to keep them busy during an office visit because, you know, this will shock you to know that sometimes you wait when you see the doctor. Uh, uh, but you got to think about this when they're at home as well. Uh, what will your child be doing during the visit? So for part of the visit, they'll want to, the physician will want to see them. They might not need to be there for the entire visit, but while they are there, what will they be doing? Are they going to be sitting by themselves? Are they going to be playing? Will they sit in your lap? Uh, obviously, it's age dependent, uh, but you want to make sure that not only what are they going to be doing during the visit, um, but what are your other children uh, going to be doing? Lots of people have multiple children that they're caring for at home. And so how are you going to entertain them while you're trying to focus on your visit? Uh, what are your goals for the visit? Uh, do you have questions? Uh, are there certain things that you want to address? Uh, and you want to be prepared uh, to, uh, lead, to make sure that you get what you want out of the visit. And then I would say discuss with other caregivers prior to the visit. What I mean by that is, uh, you know, sometimes both caregivers or all the caregivers can be present during the virtual visit, but most of the time that's not realistic. Uh, people have busy lives and they're working or taking care of other children. And so it's good to have a real clear picture of what's going on. Uh, there's things that one parent might be aware of that the other isn't and vice versa. Uh, and so just having that discussion prior to the visit I find can be extremely helpful. All right, so wanna keep everybody awake here um, and have you guys help us again with guessing what the lie is. Um, so two truths and a lie, um, a parent has been driving during one of our visits. A parent took one of us on a 10 minute tour of the playroom showing the newly constructed Lego set. Um, a child was sleeping and the parent didn't want to wake them up. Um, so we're, we're curious what you think about these very plausible um, things. And so you're just gonna put in the chat A, B or C, which you think uh, might be the lie. Looks like B is our current leader. And if anybody wants to, all right. Um, and in fact, you are correct that while we haven't had an official tour of the Lego set, um, if there, I, I will point out, I think there is some value in seeing kids um, at play as somebody who's often assessing their development. Um, so we don't necessarily need the 10 minute tour, but one of the things that I've really as a clinician valued during um, virtual visits is actually getting a little glimpse into um, patients' everyday lives. I've met a lot of pets. I've um, sometimes seen some artwork showed. And in, sometimes when there has been question, um, I recently was talking with a family where autism was a question for, of their, about their young child and actually seeing how she interacted with the parents, how she interacted even with me on the video and with toys um, was very helpful. Dr. Nelson and I and the rest of the Mass General Hospital for Children would like to encourage people not to be driving during their visits. It's really like, it, I think it gives us palpitations. Um, I've certainly had visits where family has been um, like, you know, a planned quiet kind of parking lot outside school to have a visit before school, which might, depending on what the issue is, be appropriate, but try not to be driving during the visit. Um, and, and for children sleeping during the visit, um, this is not necessarily something that's all bad. It depends a little bit on what, um, what's being assessed. And don't be surprised if the doctor on the other end says, well, can you just show me the video of how your child's sleeping? We can actually see that there's no respiratory distress. We can quickly assess um, kind of their color and you know, things like that. So um, it, depending on the issue. And um, I would don't think either of us think you have to like immediately wake a sleeping child for the visit, but just be prepared that at some point you may be asked to um, almost always um, to either wake your child up to be part of the visit or to um, show some video. Um, and again, we expect that the patient will be there unless it's very clear um, we set up ahead of time, just like in person on rare occasion for certain um, uh, 
for certain developmental questions or things like that, I will see patients in the uh, parents in the office without children. And same thing would uh, be true of a virtual visit. But the expectation going in, unless that's set up, is that both a parent and a child, um, if they're under 18, will be will be there. Okay. So during the visit, okay, we finally made it. We've scheduled the visit. We prepared for the visit. And now what do you do? So I, I really would stress get there early. Uh, I, you know, it's always the inclination to, to say, well, it takes two seconds to click a link. So I'll show up 30 seconds before and I'll be fine. Every time I do that, my computer wants to restart, the Zoom isn't working, the camera's not working, or something happens. And for me personally, I hate that kind of stressed feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late. Uh, so I would recommend getting there early. How early? You know, five, 10 minutes. Uh, it not, we're not talking half an hour, nothing like that. Um, but if you're there five to 10 minutes early, and then as you're waiting for the physician to start the visit, uh, you know, you could have a book with you, or you could be eating a snack, or, some, or you could be multitasking. Uh, but I would recommend trying to get there a little bit early. So how long to wait before calling the office? So this, the issue is when you go to see a doctor in the office and you're in person, the front desk is there and they can tell you, um, I apologize, the doctor is here, uh, but they're running a little bit behind and they're running 15, 20 minutes behind or whatever it is. You know you're in the right location and you know you're where you're supposed to be. That's not necessarily the case in the virtual world. So you could ask yourself, is my, am I in the right spot? Is the link working? Uh, am I doing everything correctly on my end? And it can be a little bit uh, more stressful in that sense. So uh, some uh, offices uh, tell you if you haven't uh, started the visit within 10 minutes, call the office. I think that's office dependent. Uh, I would say that uh, for me, I usually tell my patients, you know, um, I try my best to be there on time. Uh, sometimes things happen and I'm a little late. Uh, so give me 10 minutes. But if you haven't heard anything, call the front desk. And then my front desk uh, usually knows what's going on with my schedule, where I am. And they'll say, oh, no, you're in the right spot. We see you there. Uh, and Dr. Nelson will be there shortly. So it gives you a little bit of reassurance. And then what to expect from the clinician. Uh, when I'm a patient, I would expect the uh, clinician to know my history, uh, to have prepared for the visit, uh, just like you're seeing them in person. Uh, I would expect them to ask me questions. Uh, I would expect them to answer my questions. I would expect them to be able to refill medications, uh, give me advice, pretty much do all the things that you would normally expect uh, for an in-person visit, aside from certain aspects of the physical exam, which are uh, just not doable. Oops, is this me, Ben? Sorry. Um, <laughs> things you want to have with you. Um, you want to be able to jot a couple things down. We, we mentioned having a list. Um, this is so true in the office and virtually, um, but I think we can forget to do this in, you know, when we're just hopping between things. You want to be able to write down some of the key things um, that, um, that you may want to remember that may be a part of a follow-up plan. It is super helpful to have your child's medications with you. And this is actually, I think, an advantage of virtual visits where parents don't have to bring everything in a bag, um, but actually having the bottle where you can look and double check on something if there's a question about medication dosing or it's been changed, especially if the uh, doctor you're seeing isn't necessarily the doctor who prescribed all of the medications. Um, and I think we've uh, emphasized the idea of having the, the patient uh, with you as well. Um, what else to do when you when when things go wrong? So on our next slide, we have a couple other things to think about during the visit. Like, what do you do if the dog visits? Um, and that may happen to us too. I want to just emphasize that we are humans too, and um, a lot of your doctors may be give, doing virtual visits um, from their own space at home potentially from a non-clinical office or sometimes a clinical office where someone may, may suddenly open the door not realizing that they're on a virtual visit. Regroup, um, take a deep breath as we will and kind of, you know, you can, you know, 
move forward from there. I think if there's the the spouse who's not uh, fully dressed, a quick mute of your video is totally acceptable um, as you regroup and figure that out. Um, bring your calendar. Uh, many of us will actually kind of plan follow up um, in the moment at the visit. Some doctors will have you actually call the office or will have the office call you for follow up. But you may want to have at least a sense of when, um, you know, I may be saying like, well, I'm thinking that I'll have you back sort of between mid-August and mid-September, and that can be helpful to just have your vacation schedule um, uh, available. And really try to think about like, you're actually um, in the office. We are there and trying to be as present and thinking about the clinical care of your child in the very same way we would if we're in person. Um, and just like if you're in person and, you know, the seven-year-old hasn't showered and the three-year-old is like making a mess of the Cheerios. We understand we've chosen to dedicate our careers to the care of children. So don't be stressed about those parts, but also plan to be there and be fully present for, um, for your visit. I think that wraps up actually all of our um, formal slides. And we really wanted to spend the last 15 minutes, oh, look at the timing there, um, to um, answer any specific questions you may have. Um, about kind of virtual visits in general, things that we've experienced as um, the doctors on the other end of the visit. Um, so please like enter your questions um, and we will take them as they come. Thank you so much. Great, thank you to you both. Um, so like Shannon said, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box now and I'll read them out loud for everyone. And I will say as people are thinking here, uh, as of right now, there are no plans to decrease our availability for doing virtual visits going forward. Uh, whether that'll change in the future, we don't know. We're, we do think though there will be an option for uh, to have uh, more options for virtual visits uh, as opposed to in the past where almost everything was in person. And the other caveat to virtual visits is if you happen to not live in Massachusetts, this can be a little bit of a challenge. We're licensed in given states. And so while some of us were emergency licensed in New Hampshire and some other places for virtual visit reasons um, early in the pandemic, those um, uh, emergency licenses are starting to kind of wrap up. So you are asked to please be in Massachusetts when you're having a virtual visit. Okay, we have a question. Um, if I need help troubleshooting or starting my virtual visit, who should I contact? So there's some information in Patient Gateway um, that you can um, look through, but otherwise I would have you call the office of the physician that you're seeing. Um, the office staff has have fielded lots of these questions along the way. So give them a call, like, please let the doctor know that like I'm having a computer issue um, or in the case of my patient where I had not put the visit in, um, I was ready to about to see them and, and they were ready for me and it, the office helped connect us by like actually putting uh, the visit in. Um, usually the office has, um, you know, an immediate way to reach whoever seeing virtual visits that day. Um, and so can have a real time um, check in with the clinician. I will also say that occasionally when you're on a virtual visit, there will something will like the, the, the troubleshooting will happen in the middle. Um, and you may then together with the physician convert to like adding, a, I've, I've, I've done the audio by phone while being able to see the patient and family by video. We've used chat to kind of help with some things. Um, so I think we're all trying to be creative with you. So during the visit, you may troubleshoot with whoever you're talking with. Great, okay. Um... I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we can wrap up a few minutes early, but uh, thank you, Ben and Shannon. This was really informative. Our Thanks pleasure. For Thanks us. for having us. Thank you so much. And as I have mentioned earlier in the session, if anyone wants to view the recording of today's session, it'll be posted on the Blum Center website. I'll give it about a couple of weeks for it to get posted. It's going to be at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Hopefully Thanks, you everyone. found today's session helpful and have a lovely rest of the day. Bye.